Bonjour à tout le monde. Et comme M. Calas m'a déjà présenté, je vais tout simplement répéter mon nom et mon grade. Je m'appelle Flor Diaz Polido et je suis la chef d'unité à Juin, un petit, un petit peu plus petit que M. Calas. Alors je pense que pour que vous pouvez me voir, il faut descendre un petit peu. Et chef d'unité adjoint dans la Commission européenne, à l'unité, on vient de changer de nom. C'est pour cela que là, vous voyez un nom plus court, parce qu'on a changé lundi. Et alors maintenant, c'est Resource Efficiency and Raw Materials, mais c'est ce qui est caché derrière, c'est exactement les mêmes mission statements qu'on avait avant. Je voulais commencer pour remercier M. Calas et les collèges de France de donner à la Commission européenne cette opportunité de partager avec vous notre passion par les domaines de matières premières. Vous verrez, et j'espère que d'ici, à la fin de mes présentations, vous partagerez avec nous notre vision européenne et notre passion par, par ces métiers, qui est le vôtre et aussi le nôtre. Je voulais vous dire que puisque M. Calas m'a donné l'opportunité et que malheureusement ni le français ni l'anglais, aucune des deux n'est ma langue maternelle, je vais vous présenter, vous faire développer ma présentation en anglais, mais et, je vais conclure en français et je reste à votre disposition pour des éventuels échanges, tant en anglais qu'en français ou en espagnol, bien évidemment. Um, alors, having said so, I will start quickly because I know that we only have 20 minutes, so I will try to speed up. Please bear with me, bear with my accent, and uh, if you don't understand something, raise your hands, and then I will try to slow down a bit. I would like uh, to start with a, a, a bit of background. Uh, this, as I said before, uh, is a very young European policy. I think we are, if not the youngest, one of the youngest European policy. We have been born with the century. And uh, in the next 20 minutes, I will be watching with you exactly into the future. Of course, uh, every future starts somewhere. We started, we would say, in the last two decades of the previous century, where we went through this big change in the technology. We had the revolution in the renewables energy, the digital uh, technology that now is everywhere. We have intelligent, everything is intelligent now. Even our washing machine is becoming intelligent. So in automotive, in medical devices, everywhere. There has been this revolution where new raw materials and old raw materials has been brought in a much larger size than before. And at the same time, it has been this revolution in terms of hundreds of millions of new citizens all through the world bringing and being able to uh, share and buy all this new technology with countries like China and yeah, Brazil, all, we, uh, all those that we know uh, evolving into developed countries. We have been through a restraint, a constraint in the supply side that eventually became a demand side problem. And that uh, uh, crystallized in the year 2007 when, as I guess all of you are aware, we had uh, the big problem with the rare earth situation when the Chinese uh, decided to close the markets and then the different industries dependent on the Chinese markets on rare earth found themselves in a very dramatic situation. The European Commission reacted immediately and we adopted the raw material initiative in 2008. Um, the other two are two of the main, uh, uh, of the several tools that we use to develop the raw material initiative, but this is our policy making a, a heart. The raw materials initiative, as I was said, was adopted in 2008. We review it in 2011 and we report on it every year or two years. The last one was in May 2014. And we, as I said, we are trying to focus ourselves in helping member states and the industry to ensure security of supply of raw materials in Europe. This security of supply, we are working in three different pillars. The first one, which is the international pillars, we are trying to ensure a level playing field in access to resource in third countries. The second one we are looking inside. We know that we have a big potential in raw materials in the European Union. We are trying to incentivize the production of raw materials always in a sustainable and in a competitive way within the limits of the European Union. And the third one is a focus on how we can use best our raw materials, how we can use them in a more efficient way, how we can reuse them, how we can recycle them them or how we can substitute them whenever they are too risky, they are too critical, or there is uh, some new materials that uh, are more available and are cheaper. 
Uh, there, I will not uh, drag on, on this slide, and as, as I said before, my presentation is longer than my speech, but there you have the main conclusions from the report that we adopted one year ago on the different three pillars. And with that, I will go into the first tool that we use to develop this policy. We are talking about security of supply, but security of supply of what? Of course, raw materials, there are too many. Uh, we have mm, limited our scope to those which are not agriculture and non-energy. So as I said to my children, what you cannot eat and you cannot burn. All the rest is ours. Uh, minerals, metals, uh, forest-based uh, uh, products, <coughs> biotic products. But even so, it is a huge aspect. So we, the Commission, uh, have uh, screened uh, the most relevant or critical raw materials. We started with a list of 54 and uh, then we narrowed it uh, up uh, to 20 very critical raw materials for the European economy. Uh, we have adopted twice the list. The first one, it was in 2010. The second one, in 2013. I must say that the first list was a little bit inaperçu. The second one has been really, uh, has got really the interest of all the stakeholders. And uh, I am proud to say that by now, several member states are developing their own uh, list of critical raw materials based on the European one. They are trying to understand uh, how in their national value chain, these critical raw materials are used. And uh, uh, there is a lot of research, for instance, focused now on how we can substitute part of these critical raw materials. So, <laughs> Uh, internationally as well, Japan is uh, collaborating with us to try to have their own uh, list of critical raw materials, uh, United States. So uh, this uh, tool that uh, I will just, uh, again, I will not drag on the slide, but I wanted you to understand how the Commission has come up with the list to the list of the 20. Is uh, We have two parameters, the economic importance, which is divided in two, and the supply risk, which is divided in four different sub-parameters. And uh, as I said, with uh, taking into account this uh, axis, uh, we have got to this list. Uh, maybe you will read it uh, better once you will have uh, the slides. Uh, but uh, as I said, they are 20. We have uh, uh, some things like, for instance, coking coal, which is essential for the steel production. We have beryllium, which is key for medical devices. Uh, we have uh, many, 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 as, uh, as you see. Uh, you, we have the rare earth, both uh, heavy rare earth and light rare earth. Uh, and uh, I will close this part of my presentation with uh, a map where you can uh, see from where the European Union is getting these critical raw materials. For instance, if you take the um, platinum group metals, which are key for our automotive industries, you will see that a, a fourth uh, it comes from Russia and the other three quarters come from South Africa. And I wouldn't say the worrying, but I would say in any case, the overwhelming role that China has uh, on the supply of raw materials uh, within the European Union, because you see that I, I cannot count now how many, but at least a half of it, if not two thirds of the critical raw materials come mainly from China. So this is, as I said, the first tool that we are using to develop our policy, our strategy on raw materials. Uh, the second one is what we call the European Innovation Partnership on Raw Materials. Here I bring you a slide where you can see how we came from a flagship initiative of the, of the Commission into a concrete uh, uh, innovation partnership in raw materials, but this is the policy making. What is important for you is to understand what are we doing in this European innovation partnership. You need to think that it is a huge brainstorming. We have created kind of a spontaneous think tank where the whole value chain is covered. We cover from exploration up to substitution, goes through exploitation, processing, using, recycling, everything. We bring together the supply side and the demand side. So from Siemens or, or Renault, to the mining companies, everybody is part, has been invited uh, to be part uh, of this uh, European uh, Innovation Partnership. We launched a call for expression of interest. Uh, now, uh, I'm not sure if I have a slide on that. No, I don't think so. But I can tell you that the community is more than 800 uh, different stakeholders. Uh, we have uh, there everybody, NGOs, environmental NGOs, social NGOs, research, uh, academia, uh, consumers, 
uh, trade unions. Uh, we have brought everybody together to help us with a bottom-up approach to design this policy on raw materials. So it is not us, uh, a bunch of European officials like me, uh, hiding on a corner, drafting obscure documents. This is not at all as we work. We work really bottom up with a large consensus from the stakeholders. The Innovation Partnership was adopted in 2012, and here you have only the objectives. I bring them to you because they are important, but they repeat, which I already mentioned, as objectives for the raw material initiative. So ensure the security of supply by reducing imports, by improving the conditions of production in Europe, and always by trying to mitigate negative environmental and social impacts. This is key for the European Commission. We are not looking forward mining activities, we are looking forward sustainable and competitive mining activities in the European Union and elsewhere. Because what we wouldn't like to do is to externalize the contamination, the pollution that you were mentioning, for instance, uh, in the MENA, uh, and that it is not in Carcassonne, but it's happening in Congo. We are trying to bring this sustainable and competitive approach, uh, not only through our own policy, but uh, through our international contacts uh, um, and dialogues as well. So this is just for you to know, because we like in the Commission to become concrete. These are the targets that we have fixed for ourselves in 2020. If we do not get to 10 innovative pilot actions, but between you and me, I think we will. But if we don't get to 10 and we get to 9, this is not the end of the world. We wanted to fix ourselves in 2012 a target to work in the coming eight years. And I can tell you that we are really going through all these different targets. You will have the first innovative pilot actions in the Horizon 2020 calls this year. We are working in the knowledge base, which is data. I don't know if you are aware that, for instance, in Europe, we do not have a common data and intelligence data using and gathering as they have, for instance, in the United States or in Canada. The data remains national, which means that data are not harmonized. They are not analyzed in the same depth, for instance. So this is one of the big challenges. I cannot cover in 20 minutes, and now I only have 18 to go, um, all the things that we are doing. If uh, I leave you with the impression that we are really doing a lot, that then I will have fulfilled my objective. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that the European Innovation uh, Partnership has been developed through what we call the Strategic Implementation Plan. To do so, we brought together more than 200 stakeholders, and this Strategic Implementation Plan has been drafted by the stakeholders. They have come up to 95 different actions, technological pillar, non-technological pillar, and international cooperation. Not technological is everything that what we call framework conditions. How we can improve or help the member states to improve the legal framework, the administrative framework, to make sure that uh, all these activities related to raw materials may be developed in Europe. Not only mining activities, recycling, the way that the waste is collected, the way that the waste is sorted, uh, how we can do industrial symbiosis so that uh, we reduce the amount of waste because other industries can take advantage of what for you is waste, for them is raw materials. So as I said, we, we start with mining, but we do not stop there. And then I change into the third tool that we are using. I want to tell you that the European Innovation Partnership has no money at all. It is on a voluntary basis. So we have been able to mobilize 800 stakeholders in Europe without giving a coin, which I think is not negligible. Here is where the money comes. I guess all of you are aware and, and uh, know what is Horizon 2020. In any case, uh, I give you a quick uh, overview. Horizon is divided in three pillars. It seems that like in the Commission we like the number three and the pillars, excellent science, societal challenges, and industrial leadership. We are in societal challenges. We are in industrial leadership, and of course, in excellent science, but this is less market-related. Um, this is just uh, Le Camembert, where you can see how the money is divided. And uh, please pay attention to the pink one, European Institute of Innovation and Technology, because I will talk about that and the kick later on. 
We are in societal challenge, as I said before. You see that this is the big part of the Kamenberg, and we are under industrial leadership. We are covered by what we call Societal Challenge 5, Climate Action, Environment, Resource Efficiency, and Raw Materials. And there again, you see how the Commission always link raw materials with environment, always with the environmental and social protection. I will not drag on that. Uh, these are the objectives in the Societal Challenge 5. I wanted to bring you a list of topics, uh, but um, unfortunately the presentation was too heavy and I couldn't uh, send it through. Uh, you will have uh, the website in the end. We launched uh, more than 11 topics in 2014, more than 11 in 2015, and we are working in the work program 16, 17, and uh, they cover everything, as I, as I said before. So I will not repeat myself. I just um, brought this slide because these are the four calls which are not covered by Societal Challenge 5. So it is two under Aspire for recovery technologies of metal and other minerals and those under NMP, which is mainly, as you see, collaboration with Japan and the United States of, uh, of America. Then, uh, no, I will... This slide I will come later because uh, I want to keep on uh, the logic order. This is the fourth uh, tool that we are using and it's uh, what we call the knowledge and innovation community kick on raw materials. Uh, if you remember in the slide with the camembert, I told you pay attention to the pink part. This 2.7 billion that the European Institute of Innovation and Technology is uh, uh, bringing to the, uh, to the different uh, kind of industries, we've been very proactive uh, and we have succeeded in creating one kick, one knowledge and innovation community on raw materials. It has been, as you can see, adopted uh, less uh, than one year ago. Actually, uh, the, the real sign signature took place in uh, February. Uh, and they are still developing themselves. What is uh, a, a knowledge and innovation community and which is the difference with the EIP? The knowledge innovation uh, community has as vocation, has as goal to bring together the three parts of the triangle. So if, uh, if you know, I am, and I'm sure that you are much more aware than me what I'm going to say to you now, one of the big challenges that we have in Europe is that we do a lot of research uh, and that we are good at researching, but we are not so good at selling our research to the market and making that the market takes uh, that research and make it commercial. This is what uh, the Americans call uh, the value of death. Uh, and uh, the Americans are much more successful as, than us, the Europeans, to bring, bridge that gap. So this is exactly what the KIKA uh, community is trying to do, bringing together education, research, and business to make sure that whatever good idea you have uh, comes into the market. Uh, last week, uh, one of my colleagues uh, shared an anecdote with uh, us. I do not know if it is true. I haven't got the time to verify. But I was told that uh, Skype was, at the beginning, a European research license. It was even paid with European money. That was very successful, but couldn't make it through the market. And it was eventually bought by the Americans and became Skype. We all know Skype. So to try to avoid these kind of things in the future is uh, what we have uh, come up uh, with this new community. You read there, 25% of the money is European, but the other 75 of the money is uh, private. It's the same, the stakeholders who bring it. The total funding then is, of course, 100. No, I want it uh, here to come up. Uh, no. Uh, okay, I will then tell it orally, because I thought it was mentioned there somewhere, that the kink is very autonomous, in the sense that they decide their legal status, they decide their working methods, they decide how they work uh, together. Uh, the only thing that we do is uh, to uh, stimulate them, to facilitate the creation of the community. Uh, you can see from the slide, they are, in the slide it is set uh, 116 partners, but they are growing, they are increasing, because there are more and more partners which are joining right now. They cover 22 member states, uh, which is impressive, if you take into account that we are only 28, and some uh, member states are not so interested in raw materials. Uh, um, I wanted to signal uh, the good synergies between the EIP and the KIC. If you see here, 
on the MOVE uh, uh, square, 75% of the participation in the EIP are members of the KIC, and 40% of the leaders in commitments in the EIP are part of the KIC. Um, they do not, we do not do double emploi, but we are aware that eventually, if the kick is completely successful, then we need to rethink how we work within the EIP. But for the time being, there are more synergies than overlappings between the two, uh, the two instruments. And I am getting to the end of my presentation with uh, going back to the slide that I didn't mention before. I've uh, been, been talking about money, money for research, money for bridging the gap between research and the, money and the market. Juncker, the new president of the European Commission, has come up with a different idea. We all know that due to the crisis, the investment in Europe has decreased dramatically. Uh, it is, I don't remember now the figures, but I think at that minimum, minimum, a third lower than it was before 2007. Juncker's idea with the Juncker plan is to try to bridge that gap between the investment that we have now and the level of investment that we think it should be necessary to boost the recovery of the European economy. And uh, we are doing so uh, through a combined action with the European Investment Bank and the European Commission. You see there the big uh, figure, 315 billion. Um, the plan has not yet, the legal instrument has not yet been adopted, but the trilogue, which is in the European jargon, is the Parliament, the Council and the Commission sitting together to finalise uh, the agreement, took place uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we are confident that the it will be approved uh, before the summer and it will be launched in, during, after uh, the summer in September. I want it because we are very proud of that. Uh, I want to tell you that um, the European Investment Bank and the Commission has already pre-selected eight projects uh, as a test uh, to show how this investment uh, will uh, work in the future and two out of the eight are based on raw materials. One is on a, a metallurgical processing, a steel plant in Italy. And the second one is on pulp, on a biotic material in Finland. It is a, a state-of-the-art uh, plant which will on, not only produce uh, pulp and a lot of biotic new products, it will be able to produce uh, between a third and half of the electricity that a nuclear plant produces every year out of renewable energy. And it is not an energy plant is a pulp and paper plant. So this is the beauty of what we are doing. We are bringing really different uh, kind of, of industries together and trying to tackle different um, uh, challenges uh, from the European perspective. And with that, I am one uh, minute uh, out uh, of time. These are the different uh, websites that I, that I mentioned before. Um, J'échange en français pour conclure. J'aurais voulu vous ajouter là aussi les websites euh, du KIC, mais malheureusement, je n'ai pas eu le temps. Mais en tout état de cause, si vous allez au website de Horizon 2020, là, immédiatement, vous trouverez les liens vers le KIC. Et pour retrouver l'investment, le Juncker Investment Plan, ça vous suffit d'aller dans les European Investment Bank website. Mais sûrement, on aura beaucoup plus de publicité vers le mois de septembre quand l'instrument sera vraiment, vraiment créé. Et avec ça, j'ai conclu. J'espère ne pas avoir été trop longue. J'espère avoir été capable de communiquer notre intérêt, notre, la quantité d'initiatives que nous développons. Derrière chacune et chacun de ces instruments que je viens de vous mentionner, il y a des centaines de, de initiatives et des actions. Et nous, à la Commission, on est une petite bande, mais on travaille beaucoup. Et, et on est à votre disposition. On va renouveler l'appel, le call for expression of interest de l'EIP l'année prochaine. On va relancer un call for commitment dans le contexte de l'EIP à la fin de l'année. Jetez un coup d'œil à notre website de temps en temps parce qu'il y a beaucoup de choses qui viennent de Bruxelles et elles ne sont pas du tout mauvaises. Avec ça, merci beaucoup de votre attention et bonjour.